Just a second. Yeah, all good. I'm just trying to get used to StreamYard still. All right, I'll just uh, drop a link into the chat. So this is the video I am refuting. Am I audible? Yeshua, Baran, Nick Monk, Amadarida. Okay, cool. Sweet, that's just a bit of delay on StreamYard. It's just only my second live and I just had trouble doing it last time. Just uh, waiting for a few more people to come in. So, yeah, so this is just the C video of the series on this Hindu polemicist called as Esther Dhanraj. She has the blood of many Christians in India on her hands. Apparently, she sits in the United States, says she's an ex-Christian, and earns a living uh, making polemics out of Christianity. And much of her polemics and her arguments are just third-rate arguments and polemics. It's just coming from Islam again. You just go to any site looking at, say, supposed Bible contradictions and things like that, you'll just come across that. So in that link I've just sent you, maybe Ahmed or someone could just start circulating the link. That's the video I'm refuting. I've already done, uh, it's about 21 or 22 minutes. I've already refuted about a significant portion of the video. So today I'll just go on with the, with the 11th minute. You could actually catch those other two videos. Uh, the first one I'd done was a live, which I later converted into a premiere, and then that was the second one. Okay, I'll just say a short prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to spread your word in this session. Holy Spirit, make use of my tongue. Keep me free from error and help me enlighten the flock of God you have prepared for us and uh, refute this satanic tool of this devil. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you guys all here? Sweet. Okay, I'll just share my screen and I'll just go to her video. Share screen, share audio, go to the window. Okay, guys, can you see my screen yet? Can you see my screen? Just waiting in the chat because in StreamYard there's just a bit of a delay. All right. Okay. Is the audio good in this video? Can you hear the audio? Is the audio good, guys? Okay. Sweet. So you can hear this bitch speaking, can't you? All right, cool. So we'll come on to the objection now in her 11th minute around this mark.
Okay, I'll just pause here. Okay, you're not able to hear the video sound. You guys can't hear the video sound at all. Okay, you can hear me, but you can't hear the video. Can anyone else not hear the video? Okay, cool. I'll just fix that. Just stream yard. Just, just give me a minute. Just give me a second. I wish they could just write better, clean us off first, to tell you the truth. It's not playing. Just a second, guys. Just give me a minute. I'll just fix that. Just a second. So please bear with me, guys. It's just my second live stream. And I always find stream yard of pain. And I'm just telling that as an ID guy. <laughs> different people much difference to the message this okay is the audio all good yes emil she is esther Dunraj. this is my third video on her refuting story her. might be giving it can be ignored but when the versions vary in crucial details it poses a problem we will look at three categories of such examples First example. Uh, guys, is the video audible now? Could you just say a yes or a no? Emil, is the video audible now? Is of stories that had had profound effect on the minds okay, of good. Christian children through the centuries. It is the story of the killing of Goliath. The David and Goliath story is one of the very first stories that Christian children get to know in their lives. In fact, the only way children know about David at that age is by his heroic act of killing Goliath, who is the enemy of Israel's God. This important event in the Bible contradicts in the most crucial detail, Goliath's killer. The Bible names two different people, David and Elhanan. According to 1 Samuel chapter 17, David is the killer. But according to 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 19, the killer is Elhanan. There is a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 5, which claims that Elhanan killed the brother of Goliath and not Goliath himself. In an attempt to clarify the discrepancy, some later the translations of the Bible have added the phrase brother of to 2 Samuel verse 21 19 which names Elhanan. The problem is the Masoretic text which I already mentioned is the most authoritative text. Okay guys did you get our argument now? So what she is saying is uh, there's a contradiction between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Now, in 1 Samuel, it says that David killed Goliath, all right? 
Now in 2 Samuel, there's another passage which he's completely taking out of context where there is another guy called as Elhanan who killed Goliath. And now she's saying that these two are an obvious contradiction. But then in 2 Chronicles, uh, for those of you guys who, if you're not aware, uh, first book of Chronicles and second book of Chronicles, there are some details which are repeated from the previous books of the Old Testament uh, with some additional details put in. The, the, they are more or less like a summary of things all the way from, say, Genesis till Second Kings. But uh, from that point on, it's just a summary plus some other details which were not recorded in First Kings, First Samuel, Second Samuel. He just put that those things in Chronicles. All right. Uh, did you get this, guys? Can I proceed? Uh, did you get this part about Second Chronicles? What's it about? Guys, are you there? Oh, there's just a delay on stream yard. All right. So now the second thing is, I'll just go a little bit backward. Names Elhanan. The problem is the Masoretic text, which I already mentioned, is the most authoritative text. Now she again starts with this stupid straw man about this Masoretic text. Now, in my previous videos, refuting her, I'd already stated something about the Masoretic text that it's it's not the most authoritative text. So I'll just go to that part. It's on my Google Drive somewhere, my presentation. Uh, where is it gone? Yep, here we go. Guys, can you see my presentation on Google Drive? Yes or no? Okay, cool. Good stuff. You guys can see my presentation. I'll just go to the slideshow presented. Here we go. So just a bit of a history lesson in case if you're missing for the previous lessons. So when you're talking about how the Old Testament was compiled, so technically Moses had written the first five books. That is all the way from Genesis to Deuteronomy sometime around say 1500 to 1400 BC. Okay. And then the rest of the Old Testament got compiled within the next thousand years whatever are all the way till the book of Malachi, except you could say some books of the Deuterocanon, which say Catholics and Orthodox also accept as scripture. Now, also like the language in which the Old Testament was originally written, much of it, it's not like the Hebrew which we had, which we have today. It was actually written in a proto-Canaanite kind of script, right, like over here until like approximately 600 BC, because uh, you know what happened, Solomon's temple had fallen in say 600 BC. Uh, guys, can you still see the slide? Because I'm not quite sure about StreamYard. Just, just checking in. Give me a yes or a no. Okay, cool. So you can just see that slide. All right. So after this point, so I'll just give you this example. So this is how the Hebrew script used to look like before uh, Solomon's temple had fallen and the Jews were taken into exile. See, it used to look like this, quite pictographic. It's not like the Hebrew which we see today, like this kind of Hebrew. You can see that it's quite geometric. All right. So this kind of Hebrew was actually borrowed from the Aramaic script because when the Jews were in exile for about 70 years under the Babylonians, they had picked up the Aramaic language, they had picked up the Aramaic script. So naturally, when they had returned from exile, they recompiled the Old Testament using this Aramaic script sometime around, say, 520 BC to, say, 400 BC. Uh, did you get the spot so far? Is this clear? 
if can I move on to the next point? Okay, Catholic. Okay, sweet. All right. So this is the Hebrew we know now, and this part was compiled around 500 to 400 BC, roughly. And then we have our modern scholars coming up with the view saying, oh no, the entire Old Testament was written around this time and it was all made up. And they just want to make the claim that uh, the first five books, which we say is written solely by Moses, is actually made up of four or more authors. The so-called theory which these guys want to make about... Uh, and back over here, what is it called? It's called the JEPD hypothesis. So they want to make that claim that there were four authors who had written the first five books of the Bible. But anyway, that's the reason why, just coming to this point around the Aramaic, that's why Jesus could speak Aramaic and not just Hebrew, all right, because of this influence which came into the Jews after the second temple, after the first temple exile and during the second temple period, because Jesus was a Jew who lived during the second temple period. Okay, now coming to this part about the Septuagint, any Orthodox Christians over here? Any Orthodox Christians here? I just want to check, sorry, just a bit of a delay in stream yet, so I'm just waiting. To, for your yeses or noes to come in the chat. Any Orthodox Christians here? Okay, there are no Orthodox Christians here, because if there were Orthodox Christians here, they'll clearly know what Septuagint means. So Septuagint is the Old Testament, again, which was recompiled in Greek. That is after Alexander the Great came and conquered pretty much half the entire known world. Uh, he started putting Hellenistic culture, that is Greek culture, he started imposing it on everybody, all the nations that he had conquered. So around that point of time, say between 300 BC to 100 BC, Greek had kind of become the international language among all the kingdoms Alexander had conquered. It was kind of like the English of that time, since they imposed some parts of their culture and even their language on whoever they conquered. This also included the Jews. So at this point of time, some of the Jews, since Greek had become a common language, they decided to compile the Old Testament again in Greek, just for common usage. So that's why the Orthodox Church, they stick to the Septuagint. I'll tell you why they stick to the Septuagint. Okay. To the Septuagint Old Testament, because according to them, this this thing is more authoritative than what they say is the Masoretic text. Now, this Esther Tanraj was talking about something called as the Masoretic text. Okay, so what happened was he also had Hebrew copies with the Septuagint, although they are not very common right now. You will find most of those Hebrew copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these copies of the Septuagint were made sometime around 300 BC, that is after Alexander's death, to until the time the second Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD, as Jesus had predicted. Also, if you're reading the New Testament, 70 to 80 percent of the time, Jesus and his disciples often, they quote from the Septuagint than from the Hebrew scriptures because of the popularity of the Septuagint in that time. So now, you know, if I'm going to translate a language from, say, one language to another language, I am not going to do a very good job because there can be some words and phrases which I'll use in one language, which I'll translate into another language. They won't really look all that great. So what the Septuagint does is Phrases which you couldn't tra directly translate from Hebrew, phrases or say figures of speech, they decided to paraphrase some things. 
So you can often hear Muslim apologists or Unitarian apologists trying to attack Paul about his usage, saying that nah, Paul said this, he was quoting Psalms, but in Psalms it says something else. That's a really stupid argument because Paul was quoting from the Septuagint. He was quoting from the Septuagint paraphrase. Although when they're using the Psalms to make their case, they were looking at the Hebrew. Now, did you guys get this point so far? Did you guys get this point? I'm just waiting for, for StreamYard. Okay, do you guys have any questions, something which wasn't clear? Don't worry. I'm not Sam. <laughs> I'll go a bit easy on the blocking. <laughs> okay, sweet. All right. So now the early church, they used the Septuagint most of the time, that is the Orthodox Church, to copy over the Old Testament manuscripts. Of course, this is another reason why the New Testament was written in Greek and it was not written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Because wherever the disciples were going, they were going in the Roman world. And which kingdoms did the, Roman essentially, did the Romans essentially conquer? They ended up conquering those kingdoms, which uh, you could say the Greeks had conquered before. And Koine Greek was the language which people were using at that point of time. That's why the New Testament was entirely written in Greek. Okay, so technically at that point of time, our Christian Bible, you could say most Christian Bibles, they were entirely in Greek. Of course, if there were some Aramaic or Syriac speaking Christians, they would be having some copies of the Old and the New Testament in Syriac or Aramaic. We still have some manuscripts. Okay, so. Later on, in the 4th century, uh, St. Jerome, he translated the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts to form the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, which was used later by the Western Church, today known as the Roman Catholic Church, until, say, the 16th or the 17th century, So, which was a translation of the Greek and the Hebrew at that point of time. Okay. But technically, the Orthodox Church, that is the Eastern Church, kept on preserving the Old Testament and the New Testament using Septuagint. Now, now this is where things get interesting. You remember that Esther was quoting something called as the Masoretic Text? Okay, now what is the Masoretic Text? So, as I said, like... The Romans came, took over, they destroyed the second Jewish temple in 70 AD burned it down, the Jews were dispersed all around. And after this point of time, you know, these rabbinic Jews who were, you could say, the successors of the Pharisees, very much the same people who persecuted Jesus, put him to death, persecuted the apostles and the early church, as well as instigated the Romans and Greeks against Paul. These guys, after losing their temple, they didn't like the growth of Christianity. So what they ended up doing over the next few hundred years was they ended up editing some of the Hebrew manuscripts which were there with them. Okay? Some of the Hebrew manuscripts which were there with them. Did you get that point? Small edits, but these edits were pretty big edits. When it came to things related to say saying that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is divine, so on and so forth. So the edited parts which actually had to deal with prophecy. So if you are saying that uh, uh, Muhammad was kind of saying that the Bible was changed for, or that the Jews and Christians don't agree with each other, I have a feeling that it could have been due to this cause. The Christians were using the Greek, the Septuagint, which predated the Masoretic texts, all right? Whereas these guys were using the Masoretic texts, okay? But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are subtle changes. The Masoretic texts are more or less, you have 95%, actually 98 or 99%, it agrees with the Septuagint. But in places where it doesn't agree, 
are the places which are critical to the Christian faith. For instance, one such example is this one. Like Isaiah 7, 14, we know that uh, it says that the virgin will give birth, right? Okay, but what the Masoretic texts have done is they have edited the word slightly to make it look like it's a young maiden or a young woman who will give birth. But if you look at the context of the verse, the context of that verse, it's it's the prophet Isaiah speaking to King Ahaz or King Ahaz, however you pronounce his name. So Ahaz was a wicked king of Judah. And uh, he did not trust the Lord. He offered his sons for human sacrifices and he did all kinds of very wicked things. So he asked Isaiah, he tested God saying, Isaiah, okay, what sign can God give me that I can, you know, whatever, trust in him and whatever. Now a sign meant a miracle. You know that when Jesus performed so many miracles, the Pharisees and some of the Jewish leaders still kept asking him that question. What sign can you give us to prove that, you know, you are from God or you're the Messiah? That is a miracle. So sign meant a miracle. So Isaiah answered, this is the sign I'll give to you, house of David, since Ahaz was descended from David. He was from, he was the king of Judah, that a, a virgin will give birth. Now a virgin giving birth, that's a sign. That's a miracle. Not a young woman giving birth. That's a sign. Okay. so. And what what vindicated this? Uh, you know the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were they have some manuscripts like a lot of the Hebrew and as well as say Septuagint manuscripts, both the Greek and the Hebrew, which predated the Masoretic. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a complete manuscript of Isaiah. That is all the sixty six chapters of Isaiah in there, okay? And in that Hebrew, we see that the word there is virgin, all right? So, so much for the Jewish deception. So that's one reason why the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church are kind of quite adamant over the Septuagint Old Testament, okay? According to them, this is the better preserved word of God compared to the Masoretic corruptions. And we do have a lot of Masoretic, uh, if you're reading things from, say, the Vulgate or even the King James, although they have translated it quite faithfully, they do have, they have made use of things from the Masoretic text, but that's still okay because those translations on the whole, they're still far richer than the modern translations we see today because the language is more literal, it's more strong, and they don't sugarcoat stuff. Okay, but uh, did you get my point? And she's saying that the Masoretic texts are very authoritative. So she's again appealing to the Masoretic texts, and she made a stupid argument. You can actually see that in part 1A of the video, saying that the Masoretic text contained the entire Old Testament and it was found in a Jewish monastery. So that should be the actual kind of Bible. And uh, the other stuff could just be just manuscripts and later people just fabricated stuff. And she just made a really stupid argument earlier on in the video, which I refuted in my previous video. Okay. So coming back to that case about David, right? So just a second, where was I? Yeah, let's see. Of the original Hebrew does not include this phrase in 2 Samuel. The most logical explanation as researched and reported by Baruch Halpern is that Goliath's death was attributed to David only after he became king and that did you see that conspiracy? So they are saying that Second Samuel says that uh, David didn't kill Goliath, but rather it was just a legend created after David had become king, that David was the killer of Goliath. If you're reading Second Samuel in context, that, that thing which he's talking about, it's really very stupid. It, it's talking about David's army, about his generals and his officers who ended up killing Philistine giants. Okay, and I'll come to that part. Dad, Elhanan was really the one who killed Goliath. Baruch Halpern is a professor of Jewish studies 
and leader of some of the most crucial. Okay, now she's appealing to all these uh, scholars, so-called scholars. Okay, you know the destruction these scholars, some of these scholars, like rather a lot of these scholars do. Professor of Jewish studies, she's appealing to the scholars and the, and the theories these guys come up with. Archaeological digs in Israel area. His research is considered to be immensely valuable to the field of Jewish studies, which is why we have to take his word very seriously. Fine, I'll show you another scholar now who actually shows this guy the finger. We find contradictions even in stories that have eternal implications. For example, are children punished for their father's sins? According to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, they are. This verse says, for Okay. I'll come to this point. I'll just refute that thing first. So to refute that point, Sam actually has made an article. You know that uh, argument she made? It's actually an argument made by Muslim apologists like 20 or 30 years ago, probably 40 or 50 years ago. And it's a really stupid argument. I'll just send a link over there. Sam, Sam has refuted this article, but I'll like quickly gloss through it. Okay. So I've just sent that link on to the chat. And you know which Muslim apologist uh, made that argument? You have any idea? It was Menj. Do you know Menj, the guy who was caught for pedophilia, for watching, uh, for watching child porn in his house? He was caught by the Malaysian police. And then later, that Menj, that guy, and later he threatened Rob Christian after Rob Christian, you know, made a video exposing him. He threatened him with the with the knife and stuff and made threat threats. So Mensch. So 20 years ago, Mensch was the top apologist on, say, answering Christianity. You know, answering Christianity. It was the site created, I think, by uh, Osama. What the heck was his name, man? Osama Abdullah, I think. Yep. And Menj that time was one of the top apologists on that site. And David would used to call him his nemesis. <laughs> now nobody cares much about Menj. It's all about the Dawa gang and all these guys. Okay. So if you're coming to that article, uh, Sam quotes another scholar over there of, uh, of uh, Jewish studies who also happens to be a theologian who understands Hebrew quite well. And he's actually defended this argument. So I'll just quickly come and walk you across that article. Um, yeah, here we go. So yeah, can you see the Answering Islam article? So that is Menj's full name, Mohammed Elfi Nishem Jufairi. He's from Malaysia. Sorry if I'm just butchering the Malaysian pronunciations here which stands for Mensch. He comes up with that uh, claim, and she's just re regurgitating that stupid argument. At times, we see responding to these contradictions directly. OK, so now we have a scholar on our side. His name is Dr. Gleason Archer. OK, so he states that David cut off Goliath's head with the giant's own sword after he had first felled him with a sling and a stone. That's the story we know that in 1 Samuel 17, 15, David meets him, takes a stone, Goliath falls, and after that, he, he beards his head. In case if you don't know, he cuts off Goliath's head. Because of this amazing victory over the Philistine, David become, became the foremost battle champion among the Israelite troops, even though he was still a mere teenager. I mean, Jewish tradition states that David could have been around 14 or 15 years old at that point of time. But Second Samuel 21, 19 in the Hebrew Masoretic, again, it's the Masoretic she's appealing to, states that Elhanan, the son of Yare Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. As this verse stands in the Masoretic text, it certainly contradicts First Samuel 17. But unfortunately, like she said, that the thing in Chronicles, which I was talking about, Elhanan, the son of Jer, who slew Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. Now, if you notice the differences here, I'll just broaden this thing. So Elhanan, Elhanan, the son of Yair. So take a note, this character Y 
in Hebrew later on became the character J, which we pronounce now. So when we say Yahweh or Yehovah, we are actually saying Jehovah, okay, with the J. So since Chronicles was written some point after the book of, say, Samuel, maybe a couple of hundred years later, that's why you see this difference, Jair. Now see, this word, origin, you don't see it here, Slu Lami. You don't see Bethlehemite, but you see the word Lamai. So if you see this last part over here, Lehemite and Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. So it turns out this was actually a scribal error made, made by the scribe who had written this. And the thing was, whoever made that error, it got copied faithfully in all other copies of the second book of Samuel. Now, you know, uh, Jews at that point of time, they will just be copying things as they are without questioning, unlike Islam, where we see that people are trying to even pervert the translations and, uh, and to, you know, fill up their holes and whatever, which we see happening today. So he's kind of given the explanation over here that the direct object, again, it's going into grammar semantics, which at Chronicles, that is the verse over here. Slulamai, the brother of Goliath, the Gilead, okay? That is the direct object, Slulamai. Com just comes before Lamai was T, that is the word Te in Hebrew. The copyist mistook it for Bet, okay? So therefore, you are getting the word Bet Lamai, therefore Bethlehemite out of it. So that's the first mistake which was done. So he misread the word for brother, Hey. That is the Hebrew character for H as the sign of the direct object, te, right before Goliath. Since uh, Hebrew, Urdu, Arabic are languages, they don't, you know, employ vowels. That's how they read them. And then when you're reading them, they can infer what the vowels are. So thus he made Goliath the object of killed, Vayak, instead of the brother of Goliath, as the chronicle passage does. So this was the mistake the scribe had done. All right. And so, furthermore, the scribes carefully transmitted this error. They still copied the error as a testimony to their honesty in trying to accurately transmit the text, regardless of how difficult the reading may have been. So you can see that it's kind of vindicated. And that was a third error. The, co the copyist or the scribe misplaced the word for viewers, that is Erjim, so as to put it right after Elahan, right over here, like in the second king's copy, Yare Origin. That's the word for this. So he made a small goof up over here. Okay. And uh, it came up to that L, -L right after Elahan and as his pet pet as his patronymic, that is surname, that is the son of the forest of the weavers, which doesn't make any sense, which is kind of like an unlikely name to say that El Hanan was the son of a forest of, of, of the weavers. So so the second verse which is in Chronicles 25, sorry, in first Chronicles 25, that kind of makes more sense contextually. And also this battle which they were taking place, this battle took place long after David had become king. So probably 30 or 40 years later. So they are two separate events. And thank God we have scholars like Gleason Archer right over here. You could read up about him. And he's also written books defending uh, the mosaic authorship of the first five books of the Bible. If you go to any seminary right now, be it a Catholic seminary or a Protestant seminary, you are taught this nonsense, this nonsense that uh, that the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses, but they were written by four or five different authors, and they make all kinds of theories and all kinds of crap, and they say that they were compiled sometime between 500 BC to 400 BC by the prophet Ezra, and it was all part of some some Jewish priestly conspiracy and all this nonsense. And these scholars are just making hypotheses and theories on it, but they haven't produced a single manuscript till date, which actually, you know, agrees with their hypothesis that this was compiled from four different sources. Again, this is just plain bullshit. 
Oh yeah, you want me to zoom a bit more? This is Gleason and Archer on this page. Theological educator. So what's the beauty about him is uh, his defense of the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. In other words, there is there are no errors. The Bible doesn't teach any errors by proposing harmonizations and exegesis regarding inconsistencies in the Bible made Archer a well-known biblical in inerrantist and he died about almost 20 years ago and he's refuted this argument way back and he's just appealing to i don't know some modern scholars just coming up with these same old stupid arguments again and again and he was also critical of the documentary hypothesis which denies the mosaic authorship of the pentateuch or the first five books of the bible okay i've zoomed a bit guys If you are, yeah, yeah, sorry, I think some of you are looking at this video through your phone, so that, that could be the reason why. All right. And also, if you know that the book of the prophet Isaiah, people want to make a claim that Isaiah was written by at least three different authors, by the way. So they want to say that Isaiah 1 to 5 was written by some other author. Maybe Isaiah 6 to 12 could have been written by Isaiah himself. And then I think 12 to 40 or 12 to 41 was written by another author and then 41 to 66 was written by another author. All kinds of nonsense. After people discovered Dead Sea Scrolls dating, the, this theory of theirs, they just want to tap, still tap dance around it. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Isaiah scroll found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it dates to roughly around 150 years before the time of Christ. And it's one single scroll with all 66 chapters in it. And remember, uh, there were no chapter divisions in the Old and the New Testament. Chapter divisions were added in later, okay? Probably maybe just a book of Psalms would have had chapter divisions because they were compiled as different collections of prophecies and things. But all the others, they didn't have any chapter divisions. It was just single thing, okay? Yeah, Ahmad Ghani, yes, they do say that uh, Isaiah was written after Christ. The Dead Sea Scrolls actually spits on their face. That's the same reason why these scholars want to say that the Gospels were written after 70 AD. Because they say that Jesus made a prediction about Jerusalem falling, but that can't be possible since they have these naturalistic presuppositions over there. So technically it was written after 70 AD and they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas to tap dance and say probably it was not even written by eyewitnesses, it was written by somebody else and blah, 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 all this nonsense. Okay, I'll rather go with the testimony of the early church and the early church fathers concerning the dates and the authorship as compared to these modern day charlatans sitting out with their fat degrees teaching at seminaries and getting fat packages over the church fathers and the apostles and their disciples who not only affirm the authorship of scriptures but they tried to you know preserve the scriptures and they died for their faith guys they died for their faith they died to preserve all this handed handed over to us unlike these charlatans you see over here and they teach at seminaries and don't be surprised if and actually nowadays i've even seen eastern orthodox priests some of them talking about nah the old testament was compiled around 500 bc and all this nonsense i mean this crap has found its way into a seminary so whatever you do guys if you want to become some priest or a pastor don't go to seminary you're just going to pay money sell your soul learn crap come out okay anyway enough of my rant uh let's get back to our next objection shall we for i the lord thy god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and okay so now over here she wants to assert another objection made between uh, say made within the torah itself and fourth generation of them that hate me by this rule yahweh commanded in deuteronomy 25 
to kill the future generation of Amalekites who attacked the Israelites on their way out of slavery in Egypt. He said, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. When your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Next, according to Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Okay, so you get the objection, guys. So what's he saying? That uh, these passages, they contradict each other because two of these passages, that is Exodus uh, 20 and say uh, Jude, the other passage over there concerning the Amalek, Amalekites say that uh, the sins of the father will fall upon their children. Whereas Deuteronomy 24.16 says the exact opposite. Okay, it says that fathers shall not be put to death for their, I mean, for the sins of their children, and neither shall children shall be put to death for the sins of their fathers, which we can agree is a fair statement compared to the other one, like if you just read it simplistically. But anyway, let's go on here. This is affirmed in another passage in another book, which is Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. There's yet another story in the book of Joshua chapter 7 about the ridiculous divine business of children being punished for father's sins. It describes the stoning to death of an entire family, including sons and daughters, for the sins committed by the father, Achan. This takes place after the promise given in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Fundamentalists justify the discrepancy by asserting that the passage in Ezekiel is a revised treaty offered by Yahweh between himself and his people. I wonder which fundamentalist has said that, to tell you the truth. If they are forming a revised treaty, tell the God knows. As if with the passing of time, Yahweh grew closer to his people and he reconsidered his rewards and punishments for them. Even if we take that assertion to be true, why did Yahweh change? Okay. So she's just like a Muslim, just ridiculously just throwing out one verse after another and then going on a rant. We have seen Zakir Naik, right? He'll just spit fire like 10 or 20 verses in front of you if you just, you know, if you can't answer the question. You've seen that also in like, say, with any Muslim apologist, they'll just do the same thing. They'll say, they'll come by heart some, I don't know, some 101 Bible contradictions and they'll just try to spit those verses out. You see, spirits pretty much is just doing the same thing. Now, for us Christians, we need to examine those verses in their greater context. All right. So let's look at the first verse, which was, Exodus 20, verse 5. All right. Bible Gateway, Exodus 20, verse 5. I'll just go with the New King James Version for the time being. Actually, I won't go with Exodus 20. I'll just stick to Exodus 20, the full chapter, so we understand the context. Okay. Yes, Ahmad Ghani, you are exactly correct. Bang on. You got it, man. Over here, she was talking about the about Exodus 20 talks about the divine punishment of God, and the other is punishment when it came to uh, things written in the Levitical law, the Mosaic law. That is after the Jews took over, like how the Jews had to settle cases. That's exactly what it was. But for the benefit of the others, I'll just go take a bit of a deep dive. Now, when I'm talking about Exodus 20, here Moses is on Mount Sinai and he's getting the commandments from God. God spoke all these words, the Ten Commandments, all right? The Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Just increase the size a bit more. 
something 200% should be fine. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So if you're looking in the greater context over here, God is talking about a sin which is made against himself, okay? That people are worshipping this calf. Now, tell me, now, why does God go to the third or the fourth generation? Now, just a simple th argument. Back in those days, even now in Eastern cultures, people grew up in joint family cultures. If you're living in the West, by the time you're in your late teens, you just leave your house, start your own life, go to university, so on and so forth, in general. Now, in Eastern cultures, if uh, I am born in a particular place, right? I'll probably be living with my grandparents and also my great-grandparents. That is the third and the fourth generation. So the likelihood of me, and I'll more or less be living in that house for the rest of my life, all right? So I'll go, I'm going to be raised with those same principles. So the likelihood of me following my father's sins is very high because it's talking about the third and the fourth generation. And as in other words, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they might repeat in our footsteps. They are doing the same filthy pagan practices. Okay? So, this is the context of the verse, or its immediate context, if you look at it. And see, he's just throwing a very stupid, stupid argument. Okay? Now, coming to Deuteronomy 24. All right? We'll come to Deuteronomy 24. Again, we'll just stick to the New King James Version. Okay. So now if you're seeing in Deuteronomy 24, so if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, it's technically it, the entire book. It is just Moses' farewell address to Israel. That is, after 40 years of wandering in the desert is over, Moses is just summarizing what happened since they left Egypt in the first few chapters, and he's again just summarizing the other laws God had given them, and he's giving them final instructions, and before which he finally blesses Israel, and then he goes on Mount Sinai, and then he dies, all right? And it's likely that people say that Joshua would have written the last a couple of chapters of, say, Deuteronomy, which is fine, because it records the death of Moses, okay? So, this is the laws the Jews have to do after they have, you know, taken over the promised land. And this is how they have to settle disputes within themselves, like, say, miscellaneous laws. Now, remember, these are miscellaneous laws. It's not your Ten Commandments, okay, especially with God. So let's have a look. Uh, where is it gone? Yeah. Fathers shall not put to death, shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. But if you're looking at the greatest context over here, the greater context of this passage, it's talking about how a man deals with his neighbors. All right. It's not talking about a man, you know, willfully sinning against God and leading all his other children and whatever in the sin children and grandchildren, so so on and so forth, and his relatives. So, see, when a woman has taken a new wife, I mean, sorry, when a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. No man shall take the lower or the upper millstone in pledge, for he takes one's living in pledge. If a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren of the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then that kidnapper shall die, and you shall put away the evil from among you. Take heed in an outbreak of leprosy. We can all relate to that now. That you carefully observe and do according to all that the priest, the Levites, shall teach you, just as I had commanded them. So you shall be careful to do. 
Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way when you came out of Egypt. Yeah, Miriam was Moses' sister. She was struck with leprosy because she complained against God and she complained against Moses. Then Moses prayed to God and the leprosy was taken away from her. So again, another law. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. That is what you lend him. You shall stand outside and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. That is whatever he's giving you, okay? So that you don't have to, you know, keep your brother or whatever in naked or in a pretty bad state. You shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you. And it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of your aliens, that is foreigners, aliens meant foreigners, who is in your land within your gates. Okay. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down to it, go down on it, for he is poor and he has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and it be sin to you. Because remember, God hears the cry of the poor. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for their own sin. You shall not pervert justice due to the stranger or the fatherless, nor take over those garment as a pledge. So now if you see, the greater context of this passage is dealing with people, uh, dealing with, say, the Israelites, how they deal with each other and how they settle disputes. It's got nothing to do with the sin which they commit against God. It's got to do with the sin which they commit, uh, commit against neighbor. So if I kill the man, fine. So it's just the same law which they had, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth and nothing, no more damage to be done. Okay. So just kill the person who killed the man and or give him justice and that's about it. Don't go after his family. Okay. But still, I haven't finished refuting her, this objection. So I'll just go back a bit. So, of course, she did raise a couple more verses. Future generation of Amalekites who ask, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Israelites on their way out of slavery in Egypt. He said, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. Okay, now, how do we answer this objection? Because now God has decreed the Amalekites to be killed Okay, and now in this passage, 40 years have passed since the Israelites came out of Egypt. The 40 years are over. They are about to take possession of the promised land. But when the Amalekites had attacked them the first time, that was, I think, around Exodus 18 or Exodus 19, somewhere around that ballmark figure. When they were attacked, that is after they came out of uh, came out from the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army came, uh, then Joshua, you know that story about them. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ugh. You know that story where Moses sat on the hill and then Joshua was fighting the Amalekites and then uh, Aaron and this guy, her, I think, I think, or was it her and somebody else? They were, you know. Put placing Moses' hands on the top. So as long as Moses' hands were raised, the Amalekites were losing. But the moment Moses lost energy in his hands, the Amalekites were winning. So it's that story. Okay. Yeah, Aaron and Ur, Ahmad Khani. True. Okay. So that attack the Amalekites made on the Israelites happened 40 years before. So naturally now, God is telling you them to attack their children. So you would say, huh? But why so? Okay, so we'll get to that. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. When your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you, in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Next. Okay, now we'll come to this objection. All right, so the name of Amalek shall be blotted out from under heaven. Okay. So let's get to the concerned passage first, Deuteronomy 25. Actually, it's just the next chapter, right after this one.
and it was oops laws of social responsibility miscellaneous laws okay then a judgment on the Amalekites remember what Amalek did to you on the OV as you were coming out of Egypt okay that was Exodus 17 how you met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and they did not fear god because naturally the israelites when they had come out they were pretty tired they had just run away from the egyptians from the red sea they were hungry and Amal and the amalekites came over there to attack them okay they had no mercy on them the amalekites therefore it shall be when the lord your god has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which your Lord is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall not forget. Now, just remember this thing. Did Israel Israel blot out the Amalekites? If you read the Old Testament completely, although God decreed it, did they actually do that? In in one go? No, they didn't do that in one go. So I can just give you some supporting passages first. But now you remember, God has only chosen the Amalekites. He's not talked about the other uh, other nations, the other neighbors of Israel. Okay, so I'll just come to Deuteronomy 2. Just to explain how fair the God of Israel is. Okay, Deuteronomy 2. And the Lord spoke to me saying, so this is Moses giving a narration of what happened. You have skirted this mountain long enough, turn northward, that is Seir, that is Sinai, and commanded the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of brethren, the descendants of Esau, that is the Edomites. Since Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, Jacob's name was Israel. God changed his name to Israel and Esau was also known as Eden or Eden who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep. Because I have given Mount Seir to Ezo as a possession. So technically, he's telling them, although they will be enemies with you, don't blot out their land. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. So he's also allowing them to trade with them. From the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord has called God your sorry. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. And when we have passed beyond our brethren, that is the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, who dwell in Seir, away from the road of the plain, away from Elat and Isian Keber. These are all the names of the places. We turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab or Moab. Now, Moab were another country who were enemies of Israel. And Moab were the descendants of Lot, that is Abraham's nephew, okay, who were produced due to incest when Lot was strung. All right, just a backstory over there. Like after the destruction of so Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Lot's wife turned into a pillar, right? And Lot's daughters, they had, I think, fiancés. Even they died in Sodom and Gomorrah. So they said that probably now we'll die, we won't have children. So what they did was they made Lot drunk and they had intercourse with him. And because of that intercourse, they gave birth to two nations called as the Ammonites and the other nation were, were the Moabites. And these nations, if you read the Old Testament, were constantly at war with Israel. Okay, so now over here also God is being fire. Then the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I'll not give you any of your land as a possession, because I've given Ur to the descendants of Lot as a possession. You see, God is fair. Whatever promises he keeps, he's kept a promise with Esau, this is your land, take it. He's kept a promise with Lot, this is your land, take it. He's kept a promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is your land, take it. Okay. I've decreed the borders. You guys should be in. The Emim had dwelt there in the past, the people as great, as numerous, and tall as the Anakim. Anakim were the giants. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, that is 
the place where Esau lived, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them, that is, drove them away and destroyed them before them and dwelt in their place, just as Israel had done to the land of their possession, which the Lord had given them. Now rise and cross over the valley of the Zeret. So we crossed over the valley of the Zeret, and that time we took to we took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of the Zeret. It was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war. So technically, like in say in Numbers 14, that was a rebellion done by Korah, due to which they had this punishment of 40 years. So technically, that generation which had done this rebellion, they died was consumed from the midst of the camp just as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. So this wicked generation who had come out from the land of Egypt, all of them died, and yet their children inherited their land. That is, people who were above the age of 20 and over, they were killed. I mean, rather they died due to natural causes in the next 40 years. Some of them were killed in the rebellion. But their children... Lived. So again, God is being merciful to their children. All right. You can just see that. So it was then that all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me, saying, This day you are to cross over at Ur, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, that is the Ammonites, who are kinsmen to the Moabites, do not harass them or meddle with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession. Because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. So again, God is just being fair over here throughout all these chapters. Okay. But why this vendetta against the Amal Amalekites? Does anyone know why? Hmm? Any guesses? Take care, Mary. Mari Yunus. Any guesses why does God have this vendetta against the Amalekites? Hmm? Any guesses? Can anyone try? Are you guys there? They did lots of evil things. So I'll just come over there. Yep, that was one of the things that they did. They sacrificed their babies. And you could say the Amalekites were still in rebe open rebellion against them, against the Israelites, because despite them seeing the wonders the Lord had done, they still wanted to come and attack the Israelites. Okay, so I'll just come to... Some other point in history, which is 400 years later, yes, they used to sacrifice babies to Molech. That was human sacrifice. And some uh, Jewish traditions, some Jewish traditions, have you heard of the story of Ruth? The story of Ruth, some Jewish traditions used to actually assert that uh, Ruth's first husband, they were actually sacrificed to the god of Moab. That's how they died. That's actually some Jewish traditions say that. Anyway, that's just a sing single thing. Okay, what was the chapter I was looking at? I think it was for Samuel 15, I think. First Samuel 15, okay. So first book of Samuel. Now listen, this is say about 400 years, 400 years, okay? This is the reign of King Saul the reign of King Saul. So Israel, when they had taken control of the promised land, it was around roughly 1400 BC. That's uh, about the time Moses got these commandments from God to wipe out the Amalekites. And 400 years later, when, when King Saul was ruling Israel, now the prophet Samuel is saying to Saul, the Lord sent me to sent, sent me to honor you king over his people Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, or ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Okay, you'll find this kind of a bit controversial, but Sam has refuted this objection. You can just come and look at the video. So 
Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay wait in the city. Then Paul said to the Kenites, Go depart down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up, up out of Egypt. So now who are the Kenites? Just to give you some context, now Kenites, they were, you could say, part of the Midianites. Now who are the Midianites? Midian was an other country who were descended from Abraham. And uh, one of the Midianite priests, that is Jethro, whose other name was Ruel, he was the father-in-law of Moses. Okay, So his family, they were called as the Kenites. And they kind of gave supplies to Israel when they had come out of Egypt, helped them out a bit in the wilderness, and then went went back on their way. So again, the Canaanites departed for, from among the Amalekites. So again, you see, again, God is showing mercy here. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Now, Havilah is Arabia, by the way. That's the name, Havilah. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were un unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now you can just see Saul's greed over here. Take the, take the spoils and stuff. And he went against the command God had given him. So just imagine, even after 400 years, Amlek was still around, and they were just doing their own nonsense even now. Simple as that. So. If you are saying that God was not being fair or not being consistent, nope, I think he was pretty much being consistent. He just let them around be there, made them chance to repent and, and things like that. And for this reason, Saul got rejected as king. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret to have set up Saul as king for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. So for this sin, Saul lost his throne. And in the next chapter, Samuel goes and anoints David to be the next king of Israel. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul, I went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. See, Saul is kind of idolizing himself, and he has gone on around Paspa and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I've performed the commandments of the Lord. See, Saul is lying over here. But Samuel said, what, what then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Paul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. See, Saul didn't do a clean job. He was greedy. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I will tell you what the Lord has told to me last night. So he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? That is, see, Paul started off as a farmer. He was a humble man. Okay, yeah, Ahmad Ghani. Paul couldn't even just tap dance properly, if you could say that, if it's a poor cover-up. <laughs> yeah, so Paul was a farmer. So when he was made king, he was quite humble. He said that, how can I be king that my family is the least in my tribe and so on and so forth. Okay. And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them until they are consumed. So see, again, he's calling them the sinners. All right. Hey, good evening. IslamicStateWatch.com. God bless you. When did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Okay, and see, now Saul is trying his tap dance now, okay? Just listen to what Paul says, how he tries to justify himself. And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took off the plunders. Now see, he's blaming the people, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. This is how he's trying to either justify himself. Uh, we are going to destroy them anyway. Uh, the people just took all these things so that we can sacrifice it to the Lord as an offering. So they're still going to get destroyed. <laughs>
So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than offering sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So at this point on, Samuel goes, departs, he anoints this guy as the king, David as the king. So I think I have answered that objection concerning the Amalekites quite adequately. They were still, even after 400 years, reprobate. They didn't turn. Although, and God knew, since God knows the future, right? Okay, how people are going to behave. And even with the Canaanites, he was patient for 400 years, even before Israel came. When he had made the covenant with Abraham, after 400 years, he was still patient with them because he kind of said, I think in Genesis 15, you will, your descendants will inherit the land when the iniquities of the Canaanites have reached their, is, is fulfilled or as you know, reached their peak. Okay, so he does give people a chance to repent, but if they don't do that, it's simple as that. So now there's this one more passage which this witch brings up. I'll answer that one as well. According to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. This is affirmed in another passage in another book, which is Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Again, as I mentioned before, Ezekiel was just quoting the judicial laws of the Jews, which were mentioned in Deuteronomy 24, and this had got nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. There's yet another story in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, about the ridiculous divine business of children being punished for father's sins. It describes the stoning to death of an entire family, including sons and daughters, for the sins committed by the father, Achan. Okay. Now, again, I'm going to take this passage in context and refute our lies. Okay. So let's have a look at Joshua chapter 7. Defeat at I. So to understand Joshua chapter 7, let's go to Joshua chapter 6. Okay, so just to get context in the Bible, the context could be in the chapter itself, or the context could be in the previous chapter within the Bible, or the context could be from the previous book within the Bible. Okay, just to understand context. I mean, that's how deep you need to know your Bibles to refute these objections. But some can just be refuted by just reading the entire chapter. Okay, so I'll just come down to, this is chapter 6. And, uh, okay, so in chapter 6, they are actually taking the city of Jericho. And at this point, this guy, Achan or Achan, he actually sinned. So, I'm just coming down. So, when they were taking the city of Jericho, now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until a day to you shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, that is the city of Jericho, around it once. Then they came to a camp and lodged in the camp. Okay. And Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched. So they just did this thing for six days. And then on the seventh day, when they took down the city, now Joshua, that is on the seventh day. And when the seventh time it happened, that is on the seventh day, when they were circling around the city, the entire Israelite army, the priests along with the ark, when the priest blew the trumpets, then Joshua said to the people, Shout for the Lord has given you the city, that is the city of Jericho. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. Now Rahab was a harlot, or rather as you could say a prostitute who lived in that city. 
but she helped out the two Israelite spies who were spying on the city and she had kept them safe from the guards of Jericho capturing them. So she just asked them, like, will you keep me safe after if in case if you know you guys take over the city? So they promised yes. So and they kept her. And by the way, Rahab was also an ancestor of King David. So this is the mercy God showed soon had shown her for turning away from her sins. So only Rahab, the, the harlot shall live, that is her family with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent, that is the two spies. And you by all means, now Joshua is talking to the people of Israel, abstain from the accursed things. Now accursed things meaning to say some cursed things or cursed objects these guys used to keep. It could be gold or silver or stuff with the blessings or the, the blessings and you know you could say rituals of their gods in it lest you become accursed that is lest you become cursed yourself when you take off the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it so you could be knowing about these things like voodoos and taboos and these kind of things so naturally on certain objects there are some demonic powers tied to it just to take a note of that okay but all the silver and the gold, so now Joshua is making a distinction. What things you can take from the city and what things you can't take. So he's taking these certain things you can't take, lest you're going to bring a curse on the entire camp. But all the silver and the gold and vessels of bronze, okay, and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord, okay? So he's making kind of a distinction what we can take over that. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the walls of Jericho fell down flat. So that's where you get this phrase, the walls of Jericho. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and then they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Again, you could say this is, if you want to apply presentism, this is kind of controversial, but these passages have been answered quite adequately. Okay, and the young men who had been spies sent in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they were spared. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Only these certain things could go, but not the other stuff where people have made rituals and asso associated them with demons and so on and so forth. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua spent, sent to spy out Jericho. And again, Joshua is again reiterating this command. Joshua charged, at that, charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds the city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest. He shall set up its, its gates. Uh, youngest, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the country. So this was chapter 6. Now we go to chapter 7. Okay. So now in chapter 7, we have to come to that point. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan or Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Sabri, the son of Sarah, of the tribe of Judah, took one of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So technically, they ended up, you know, getting a curse on themselves. Okay, so the next time, they went to conquer the next city, which was Ai. Now, Ai was a far weaker city as compared to Jericho. But what happened was, Israelites lost that first battle. Okay, they couldn't conquer it. They they lost their men, they lost their troops, people got killed because of the sin. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avin on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Okay. Do not weary or rather say tire all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So now see Joshua strategically, since he's a military commander, said this is a weak city. Fine, let's take it. Two thousand men should be enough. 
So about 3,000 men went up there from the battle, but they fled before the men of I. They still lost. And the men of I struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down in the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and it became like water. So now people got scared. They lost their courage. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. Here he is prostrating before the ark, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. So it's kind of like a sign of mourning, a sign of repentance, a sign of sorrow. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it. So now Joshua himself is getting fearful, despite coming so far. He's losing his faith, his confidence. And surround us and cut us off our name from the earth. Then what will you do, Lord, for your great name? And, but he's still seeking God for answers. Answer me, Lord. He's questioning God. Why did this happen? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. You see, you bring all these kind of tabooed objects or these demonic objects with some demonic satanic influence on it and put it inside your house. I mean, most modern people will think these are superstitions. Not, not really the case. There are spiritual forces associated with those things. Okay, people would say that these are chinkses and all that, shouldn't be believing in that. No, the spiritual realm is real, guys. And this stuff is happening, and it was a command from God to Joshua. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their back before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I, the Lord, be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. So this is, again... God saying that, get up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst of Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So it's kind of like even a message for us, right? Like uh, if you're saying sanctification of people in the Old Testament, whenever kings or entire people decided to repent before the Lord, then God would come take away that some kind of a calamity, calamity away from them that they would you know end up purifying the land. Best example is Joshua going to the Assyrians at Nineveh. The Assyrians repented. God took the calamity away, and there were lots of kings in say Judah who kind of repented because of their sins, and God took some more calamity away from them. So same thing like say now with covid people will be saying they'll be relying so much on this vaccine and whatever and whatever and whatever but the thing is if countries and leaders don't repent from their hearts of what they are doing they'll just be afflicted with one calamity after another because it's the repentance coming from the heart the sanctification that matters for god to change things and work things in your favor all right in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families. And the families which the Lord takes shall come by households. And the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that who is taken with the that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. And all that he has because that man has transgressed the covenant of the Lord because he has done such a disgraceful thing in Israel. So, yes, Samad Ghani, precisely, repentance leads to mercy. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribes of Judah was taken. Then, of course, they, they used to throw lots, cast something like casting die, but they used to decide this using some objects called as the Urim and the Thummim, which had to do with the priests, to decipher the will of God. And then they finally, to try... So they sorted out from Judah, they got the Zarites, which is the clan, and from the family of the Zarites, they took the family of Zabdi, 
and then from the family of Sabdi, they went by household and they took Akan, the son of Karmi, the son of Sabdi, the son of Sarah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Akan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me, Now what you have done, do not hide this sin from me. And Akan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. Now pay very careful attention to the sin which he has committed. Okay. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, okay, so he's taken a big garment with him, okay. 200 shekels of silver, oh boy, that's quite a lot of whatever, money, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them, he desired them, and took them. And uh, they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tents with the silver under it. Now just imagine what he's done. He's taken it into inside his tent. So back then they, were, they used to live in their tents since they were still migrating you know, making, uh, conquering lands. So he used to live in, in a tent with his household. So naturally, and what has he done? He has buried it in the ground, hidden it in the earth. Now tell me, if I'm going to come inside my tent, I see my family and they see that I've got a lot of stuff, they'll naturally see me, right? And if I'm trying to dig the earth and bury stuff, it's not going to go unnoticed, right? Of course, my family are also going to see that and they are going to help me cover this stuff. stuff this gold at the end of the day. So naturally speaking, my family are also involved in the sin. Otherwise, how is it possible for me to smuggle so many things into my tent after I come back from battle without any of my family seeing it? So naturally speaking, my family are part and parcel to this crime. They have abetted to the crime. They are criminals, okay? Just as much as I am. See, they are hidden in the midst of my tent, buried under the earth with the silver under it. You see? So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in this tent with the silver under it. And they took from them the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. That's it. Guilty is charged. Then Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold. See, this is all the stuff he's stolen. His sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Acor. So it's a given that you're living in a small tent. Your family are naturally going to see this, and they are going to look out. out, out. They're just going to you know, be sentries outside your tent just to see that nobody else is coming so that you can quickly hide this. And people who live in, come from an Eastern culture pretty much know what I'm talking about, okay? When it comes to, say, laws of inheritance, and estate and property and stuff and how family members do all these things you pretty well know what i'm talking about and these guys come from that kind of a culture you're the ancient israelis so it makes perfect sense and joshua said why have you troubled us the lord will trouble you this day so all israel stoned them with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones then they raised over them a great heap of stones till they still there to this day now, this day means that it's around the day the book of Joshua would have been written. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the valley was called the Valley of Achor to this day. Now, Achor just means trouble. And that was his name, Achan. So he just kind of made a pun on his name that he, of course, this trouble, Achan. So, yeah, precisely, JDR. That's what happened. It's just foreshadowing for this greed. People just do all these things. Okay, now I'll just answer a final objection. Now, over here, she starts blaspheming our God. She actually starts blaspheming our God. This takes place after the promise given in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Fundamentalists justify the discrepancy by asserting that the pathway between himself and his people as that assertion to be true. Why did Yahweh change his goalpost so frequently in such a small gap in time, which indicates his fluctuating righteousness and mercy? Yeah, she's gone about blasphemy and God calling that yeah, Yahweh just changes his mind, like how Allah changes his mind within the thing just to suit Muhammad. What, seriously? Just wait how I'm going to attack your gods, you cow worshipper, stone licker, cow licker. 
questioning the Christian claim of moral absolutism. The second example in the category of eternal implications is the giving of Ten Commandments. Not one, but two sets of Ten Commandments have been given by the Israelite God. Yahweh calls Moses to... Okay, so if you guys know... <laughs> ...a mountaintop and dictates to him Ten Commandments, which Moses writes on two stone tablets. After spending 40 days and 40 nights on this, Moses comes down the mountain and smashes the stone tablets to pieces in So just take a note. So technically she's saying that maybe Moses had written 20 commandments and she, she, and she makes a stupid claim later, a really stupid claim. I'll come to that claim. But you guys know the story, right? Moses went up to Sinai. He received the law. But besides the law, he also received other commandments from God which had to do with judicial matters among the Jews and things related to festivals, so on and so forth. And when he comes down, he sees them worshipping a golden calf. And in his anger, he strikes the golden calf with the Ten Commandments and he just destroys it. And then again, he goes again on the mountain, asks God for mercy, prays there 40 days and 40 nights and comes back again with the Ten Commandments. And speaking of golden calves, you know that the calf is a young one of a cow. So, yeah, I know why you're getting angry about our God because of what happened over here. You cow licker, calf licker. <laughs> Anger at his people because they made an idol and started worshipping it while... Yeah, the same kind of idols you worship and lick. Calf, cows. Seriously. He was gone. Yahweh then calls him back to the mountaintop, telling him that he will give the same commands that he had given earlier. They spend another 40 days and 40 nights. But Yahweh only manages to keep two of the original and replaces eight. Now she's just an idiot. She's saying that uh, God just manages to keep two of the original and he replaces eight of the Ten Commandments. How stupid is that? How stupid is that? And then she misreads Exodus 34, skipping over Exodus 20 to Exodus 31, and she skips over Exodus 12, and then she just comes up with her own headcanon, seriously. According to Exodus 20, the traditional 10 are to keep the Sabbath, to not kill, to not steal, etc. In Exodus 34, when Moses is called back, Yahweh replaces eight of the ten to include the most bizarre commandments like not sacrificing anything with yeast, like celebrating the festival of unleavened bread, and to not cook baby goats in their mother's milk. That was blasphemy. Utter blasphemy. After I'm done with this objection, see, I'm just going to destroy your gods. Apart from the embarrassment to Christians that their God, who they claim is the creator of the universe and the God of all cultures and nations, had nothing more important to instruct man than how to cook livestock and offer the meat to Yahweh and guidelines to observe his festivals, they have Yahweh's inconsistency aspect to account for. The fact that Yahweh changed his mind in just a day about what his chosen race must do to gain his favor indicates the fickle-mindedness of Yahweh. Oh gosh, this is the height of blasphemies, this wicked, satanic, vile whore is going to know. A fickle-minded being is not worthy of worship. Okay, just wait after I'm done refuting this objection. It must be a difficult and an embarrassing task for the apologist to defend this divine goof-up of what- Divine goof-up, my foot are alleged to be the most important commandments for mankind. They do it nevertheless by claiming that Yahweh meant to keep both the sets. The first was given as an ethical set and the second as a ritual set. Uh, tell me which Christian apologist comes up with these arguments? <laughs> She's saying Christian apologists come up with these arguments. Second and commandments are for rituals, first and commandments are for ethics. Oh gosh, man, seriously. <laughs> I don't know what to say over here. What's she smoking? Is she high on something? <laughs> the Bible itself poses a problem to this assertion. 
Yahweh explicitly says that the second set in Exodus 34 was going to be a replacement for the first set which Moses broke, not a supplement. He also adds that on these I will establish my covenant with Israel and that they were the Ten Commandments. If Yahweh was going to establish his covenant with Israel on the second set of the commandments, what was the purpose of the first ones? Why waste that much time? As if the leader of the chosen race and the creator of the universe had no better things to do for 80 days and 80 nights. Note that Yahweh does not say that they were the second set of Ten Commandments in addition to the previous ones that have been broken. If he had meant to give 20 commandments, Shouldn't it have been made popular? She is drunk 20 commandments. <laughs> As 20 commandments instead of 10 commandments. By the way, the 10 commandments has a name and it is Decalogue. Also, if Yahweh meant both the... Oh yeah, no need to show how smart you are just by just knowing that one fact it's called Decalogue. ...sets to be followed. He should have first rewritten the broken set and then added the second set to it. But none of this happens. Ironically, a large section of Christians is blissfully unaware of there being two sets of Ten Commandments. Another major discrepancy in the category of eternal implications is about how salvation is attained. I've refuted this objection on how salvation is attained in part 1b of the video. I'll just uh, go to refuting this objection of hers and then let's have some pot shots at her Hindu deities. All right. So, okay, he gave me second. All right. So, I'll just go a little bit behind. In Exodus 34, when Moses is called back, Yahweh replaces eight of the ten to include the most bizarre commandments like not sacrificing anything with yeast. Okay, now not sacrificing anything with yeast. You say Exodus 34? Okay, let's go to Exodus 34. It does say that. It does say that. I can agree to that point. But let's read Exodus 34 in context. So Exodus 34, and the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stones like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So he, so the same words. He's saying the same words which were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain, that neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut the two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the God, the merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So here the Lord is just greeting Moses. Is he giving him a commandment? No. He's just greeting Moses over here. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, if I have now found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are stiff-necked. Now stiff-necked meaning to say a stubborn, rebellious people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as, our, as your inheritance. So Moses is interceding for the people for the sin of their golden calf. And then he's saying, he's just reiterating his covenant over here, the Lord. The covenant renewed it's just saying the covenant has been renewed okay so he's just kind of saying so certain things which he had repeated before but he's not saying like these are the ten commandments you have to write them again which is kind of like really dumb be able to make a covenant before all your people i'll do marvels such as have not been done in the earth nor in any nation and all the people among you shall see the work of the lord for it is an awesome thing i will do with you 
Observe that I command you this day. Behold, I'm driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is jealous, uh, is a jealous god, lest you. Now, if you see over here, She's thinking that these are the Ten Commandments all over again. But God is just talking talking in this context about what these guys should be doing after this. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments in general. He's just repeating some things which he has said before. And I'll prove it by using previous chapters of Exodus. I'll come to that. Okay? Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods. Now, this is again spiritual you know, prostitution, that uh, if the people, you know, start worshipping the gods in the lands and make sacrifices to their gods and any one of them invites you and eats of the sacrifice and you take off his daughters for your sons and his daughters, you play the spiritual whore with their gods and make your sons play the whore with their gods. You shall not make no golden box for yourself. Now this feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Now you can see very specifically he's giving them certain other laws but he's not telling Moses to write these laws on the ten stone tablets, all right? Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. So unleavened bread means bread without yeast, okay? In the appointed time of the month for Abib, for in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. That is the first month of the Jewish calendar. They come out from Egypt, okay? So that's how they tie their Jewish calendar, okay? So... So now these laws, which he's talking about, they were done earlier, okay? So I was talking about the unleavened bread, so I'll just come to Exodus 12. I think I'll just stick to the NIV version for now, although I just don't like it so much. Uh, let's go to Exodus NIV. Just look for the word yeast. There you go. So this is Exodus 12, people. He's just reiterating what he did in Exodus 12. And if you see this, he's just talking about the covenant which was renewed, which he had made earlier. He's not explicitly just talking about the Ten Commandments. As simple as that. That same night you are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with the bitter herbs and bread without yeast. Okay. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you have to eat it with your cloak tied. So he's just talking about the Lord's Passover over there. Okay. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So for seven days, you are to eat bread without yeast. And the first day, remove the yeast. So he's just saying the same thing which he said in Exodus 12, which they have to do as remembrance about them coming out of Egypt. And this person, Esther Dandraj, is going about saying that, nah, Yahweh changed his mind in the day, and he's just making up new rules. Wow, what an idiot. Okay, now what the second objection he's saying? Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and harvest you shall rest. That's okay, he's again just reiterating the covenant. He's not reiterating the Ten Commandments. Now, all these passages over here, they are there in Exodus. If you read all the way from Exodus 17 to Exodus 31, you'll see them. Okay, he's just summarizing the covenant which he had made earlier over here. That's about it. Okay, now what is that thing about? Okay, she was talking about cows and sheep and goats, right? About, about in their mother's milk where she was blaspheming God. Okay, what is that passage again? Exodus 23, yeah, that was again Exodus 23, which is again before Exodus 34 and before Moses broke the first set of Ten Commandments, okay? So Exodus 24, I think, uh, see, again, he's talking about the annual festivals they have to keep again in Exodus 24. This is the same thing, yeah, they keeps repeating again and again. Oh, no, JDR 353, she'll never come for a debate. She'll never come for a debate. See, oh, three times a year, all men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord. I just read that out again in Exodus 34. 
So God is just giving Moses the summary of the covenant and just renewing it. She's such a stupid idiot. And here, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. There you go. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Bring a first fruit to your soil. So technically, he's just spouting out those commandments. Okay, The first fruits of the land you shall bring to the house of the Lord. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So as I mentioned... There you go. Do not offer the sacrifice of the blood, the fat of the festivals. Uh, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Seriously. Then write these words for according to the tenor of these words, I've made a covenant with you and Israel. Okay. So now these words which he's talking about is the book which Moses is writing, the Torah. Okay. Parts of Exodus over here concerning the laws, Exodus, and later on Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And now in chapter 28, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Moses neither ate bread nor drank water. And then he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So you can see the difference over here. All right, so now I'll just come to other passages to refute this idiot, to just say that those are the same Ten Commandments. Let's go to Deuteronomy 5. Next. Yeah, right. Them and their million headed serpents, their gods, so called gods. So, Deuteronomy 5, I'll have to scroll down a bit. The Ten Commandments reviewed. Now, Moses is here. Deuteronomy 5. The entire book of Deuteronomy is Moses standing before the promised land, giving his farewell address to Israel, okay, and just summarizing what all has happened. So here he's again talking about the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy. And Moses called Israel and said to him, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them to be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, that is Sinai. The Lord did not take this covenant with our fathers, but with us who are here today, okay, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. You're afraid because of the fire and did not go to the mountain, he said. And here, yeah, Moses is again talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not carve, make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow them or serve them. So he talks about all the commandments. I won't go through it again. He talks about the Sabbath. He's talk, talking about not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, seven days for Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not despise your neighbor's house's field, desire your neighbor's house's field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything that's your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to you, all your assembly in the mountain, from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. There you go. He added no more. Okay? And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. All right. And then Moses goes on to say that uh, he had to end up destroying that thing. So I'll just go to Deuteronomy chapter 9 next. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 9, and it's about, yeah, verses 10. So he's talking about what happened to the original commandments. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, and neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the Lord delivered me to be two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days and nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Okay. So then he talks about him destroying it. 
I'll go to Deuteronomy 10 next. The second pair of tablets. At that time, the Lord said to me, hew for yourself two tablets of stones like the first and come to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I'll write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke and you shall put them in the ark. There you go. Again, double testimony, double confirmation in Deuteronomy when Moses is summarizing what happened in Exodus all the way from Exodus 20 to Exodus 34. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in the hand. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. End of topic. All right. Satanic, vile, wicked liar. All right, so now let's go and let's have some more fun now at her gods. I'll just drop a link here into this thing. Just tell me once you get that link. Did you get that link, guys? I've just dropped it in the chat and I'll just drop another link. Just a second, guys. And you should thank some people for giving me this material against Hinduism. You should thank this guy Gopal, who is running this ministry called as Yeshua Apologetics. He's a Hindu convert. He's a Hindu convert to Christianity. All right. He's barely 18 years old and he knows heaps of stuff. I actually learned a lot from him. And then there's another Indian apologetics channel called as. Uh, Nani's world, Gyani's world, G N I S A S. They have a Discord server, and on that server, they also have a channel, a YouTube channel. You'll get all this kind of material to refute Hinduism. Okay. All right. So I'll just drop the other link. Just a second. And here we go. Okay, so now let's get to those links. Now let's look at the first link. So this is about their Sanatan Dharma. Can you see the link? That is the Brahma, one of their supreme gods, according to the Hindu school of Sanatan Dharma, which itself is kind of can be falsified even within the realm of Hinduism. I'll talk about that later. Maybe in an upcoming video, God willing. Okay. One of the most important gods of Hinduism, I'll just increase the font size for people's benefit. One of the most important gods of Hinduism, or Sanatan Dharma variant of Hinduism, that's mainstream Hinduism, is Brahma, who is the grand creator of the universe and the one who gave Vedas to humans. But can a god lust for his own daughter and another god's wife okay so daughter once on an occasion the prajapati brahma on seeing his daughter became passionate and was ready to hold sexual intercourse with her at this those six sons laughed at him brahma cursed them saying you all go quickly and take your birth in the wombs of the asuras <laughs> And this is the source, Srimad Dev Bhagavatam, Devi Purana, chapter 22, verse number 9. I could also link you to the source. Just give me a second. So where is StreamYard gone? Oh, StreamYard. Just put this here. Yeah. Ahmad Ghani, they, these guys make a Lomo, Momo look like a good guy, man. Muhammad looks like a good guy, to be really honest. <laughs> now let's look at another source translated by another scholar. Afterwards, the creator, seeing that form of ex exquisite beauty, was fired with love and repeatedly uttered. What an enchanting form. At this, the Ma Manasaputras, now these Manasaputras, meaning again to say these sons of Brahmas whom he created using his mind, 
of Brahma, that is Vasista and company, taking Savitri for their sister, began to express their feelings of seething indignation and contempt at the attitude of their father, Lord Brahma. But he was so much absorbed in love that he did heed anything in the least. Brahma continued uttering, Oh, what an enchanting form about this entity called as Savitri, a woman, another goddess. Oh, what an enchanting form. For his love for the goddess Savitri and the latter, after saluting him, began to what's this word? Circumambulate. So, yeah, circumambulate, meaning to say circ meaning to say circle around him in reverence. So she started circling around him in reverence. Okay. Brahma fixed his gaze on Savitri and could not distract himself from her. This is their supreme god, folks. <laughs> As she was circling around him, he felt shy of turning his head each time to her direction. As his Mansa Putras, that is his sons, were standing close by. See, what a vile, wicked beast. He therefore created four heads, okay? <laughs> each pointing to a direction in order that he may see, each pointing to a direction in order that he may see Savitri undisturbed without having to turn him, turn his head each time in course of her circling. See, what a bastard. This is their supreme god. Seeing Brahma in such a condition, Satarupi went to heaven with the Manas sons of the creator, that is the Manas Putras. Putras means sons, that is the sons of Brahma. And as she was traveling towards heaven, Brahma put on a fifth head. This guy makes Muhammad sound like an amateur man, right on top, which afterwards he covered with long matted hair. Oh, wow. He puts a fifth head and covers it with long hair. So people can't infer that he's, he's looking at her. This is how Brahma came to have five heads. Brahma fired with passion in her company, married Satarupa, and big Sata, Satarupa, meaning to say seven forms, and began to pass his days in enjoyments inside a lotus. He enjoyed the company of Savitri for 100 years, and after a long time, Manu was born to them. Manu thus born was Swarambhu Munu, who, owing to his close affinity to Brahma, is also called Adipurna, the first man. Okay, now Manu means man, mankind. And see, this is kind of a perverted version of Adam, Adipurna, the first man. Now, Adipurna meaning to say it's, we have a derivative in like Urdu called as the word as say, uh, you could say Adami. Adami means a Adami or the spawn of Adam. That's what we call men in Hindi, Urdu languages. And you could see that this is a stolen version of the Christian story and they have perverted it to their own thing. And here's the source, guys. Matsya Purana section three translated by various Sanskrit scholars it's translated by various Sanskrit scholars, edited by B.D. Basus. Okay. And I'll drop you the source over here as well. Okay. Uh, let's go up to StreamYard. Yep, that's crack discount cookie and added through that. Still not satisfied. Okay, let's see another book. His transcendental value is not to be minimized. Oh, you guys would have heard this stupid word, transcendental meditation. Even though Brahma exhibited a tendency to enjoy his own daughter. There is a purpose for the exhibition of such a tendency by Brahma, and he is not to be condemned like an ordinary living entity. Support on Srimad Bhagavatam, 3.12.48 by Swami Prabhusada, and that's the source for this as well. This was also works as a defense of Brahma action, but the detailed defense of Brahma action is given section four of the Masya Purana. The defense raises many serious questions, but first the defense. Okay, I'll just drop this source in as well. Uh, there we go. This is how disgusting and filthy Hinduism is, guys. And to tell you the truth, the average Hindu which you see they are this ignorant about their scripture. They don't know anything about their scripture. They will just ask their priests and their witch doctors and all these sages to perform their rituals and that too in Sanskrit, a language which they themselves don't understand. And they just blindly follow their rituals without question. At least you could say Muslims are smarter than them. 
it's it's that bad it's that terrible and that violent satanic okay sorry where am i here back here that is discord by the way okay source of matsya purana given above this explanation arises following questions the above passage tells us that god does not come under the karmic law so that they can now you know karma right your good deeds versus your bad deeds okay so they can do proper or improper things but the moral law humans follow comes from god now you remember that she was talking about uh, absolute morality argument coming from christianity oh yeah you guys are using the same argument over here which you are saying is coming from your god bitch but god himself can do more mor- moral or immoral things although he does give the moral law oh wow that's an inconsistent god so why should somebody follow a law given by somebody who doesn't follow it and can go against of it but but will judge you according to it tell me this is not jesus who came down to fulfill the law who lived by the law who fulfilled the law entirely to the letter and therefore he can judge us by it being man and god in section 4 of matsya purana source given above we read that the children of brahma were allowed to marry in their parental circle yak o oh, master of the universe by graciously explaining to me why the offspring of brahma were allowed to intermarry in their paternal circle without any regard for close knit kinship part 2 shiva's wife now he's coveting the wife of another god shiva just watch this shiva and sati's marriage is taking place this is the context my mind being afflicted by love i started at the limbs of sati o oh, excellent brahman i was deluded by shiva's maya the more i stared at the beautiful limbs of sati eagerly the more i became thrilled like a love afflicted man staring thus at the chest daughter of daksha and being afflicted by the cupid o oh, sage i craved to see her sati's face since she was bashful in the presence of shiva i could not see her face she did not show out her face on account of shyness then i began to consider a proper means whereby i could see the face oh boy this is their supreme god oh boy afflicted much by the cupid i pitched upon the production of airful smoke as the means thereof i put many wet twigs into the fire only very little ghee did i pour into the fire much smoke arose out of the fire from the wet wings twigs from the wet twigs so much so that darkness enveloped but the whole altar ground and the neighborhood then lord shiva the supreme god indulged in many sports covered his eyes apparently afflicted by smoke then no sage now this is now here comes the fun part Then no sage afflicted by the cupid and delighted in the hearts in the heart of hearts I lifted her veil and stared into the face of sati this is brahma saying this i looked at the face of sati many a time i was helpless in curbing the onset of a sensuous or- orgasm or- orgasm i mean it's orgasm over here it's not organism four drops of my semen <laughs> Oh my gosh! Viral got displaced and fell to the ground like drops of dew as a result <laughs> of staring into her face. Just imagine this guy ejaculated just by looking into the face of uh, looking into the face of the wife of another god. This god did that. Oh sage! When I was turned into silence, I was surprised. I became suspicious. I covered up the semen drops lest anyone should see them. Sound familiar? It sounds like Muhammad now, doesn't it? All these wicked satanic cults, same thing. Even if you're talking about the Greek mythology, same thing. If you're talking about Roman gods, the same thing. The same fake religions everywhere. Go to South America. you'll find the same thing was being practiced among the astics child sacrifice human sacrifice and all these things and they'll blame the catholic church for being oppressive towards them please please if the colonists didn't go over there they would have been eating us for dinner shiva purana rudra samhita chapter 19 verse 18 to 29 translated by Chail Sastri source. Here's the reason of this act is given. Shiva Maya. But now can a god come under the influence of another god's power and so much that he'll drop his semen? The question I asked in part one also implies over here. My advice to you: 
Download the Bible app and start reading the New Testament. May the Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, show you the way. I rob the source and I'll even do Shiva. All right. And then we'll just close off for the day. After that, uh, here's the source here. There you go. And uh, that Shiva article that given before. Let's come over here. I think this material is on Kanyani's world. Yeah, Kanyani's world. And we have quite some articles over here concerning their Hindu gods. I'm yet to do Krishna. That guy was a playboy. He's the playboy of Hinduism, Krishna. All right. And you have all these filthy, vile Christ mythos and these bastards trying to compare Jesus with Krishna. That Jesus is a copycat savior. He's just based on the Hindu god Krishna. And they just draw all kinds of stupid false parallels. Seriously. Okay, we'll just go to Shiva. I dropped the link before. I'll just drop it again in the chat. Shiva, a god with the problem of lust and the mystery of Shivalingam. Okay, now let's see the Shivalingam, the stone which Hindus call as sacred. Okay, yeah, nothing different. You had the stone liquors among the Mohammedans. And if you read Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, you could see that people used to worship a meteor stone which came from the sky, which they said belonged to the goddess Artemis or the Roman counterpart Diana. And then they started persecuting St. Paul because he convinced the people to stop worshipping these things and to worship Jesus, the one true God. So yeah, stone licking, it's been happening since God knows when. So Islam is actually nothing new. Okay, now all the verses to this article are taken only from Hindu Sanskrit scholar translations, okay? Some scholars have used this 18 plus language. Oh yeah, did you know Ahmad Ghani? Ram had married Sita when she was six years old. I just uh, kind of discovered that fact yesterday. Ram was 14, Sita was six. So this is again coming from Hindu scholars, translations are writing this article. Source of every piece of information is provided as before. Part one, lust. Lust is always seen as an immoral feeling, no matter which worldview you belong to. But our moral framework comes from God. What if God himself lusts? When Sati, the wife of Shiva, left off her mortal coil, Mahadeva, though he could remove the sorrows of all, was very much moved with passion and greatly afflicted. Then being burnt very much, as it were, by the fire of passion, he threw himself down into the water of the river Kalindi, and the water of that river became black colored as if burnt by the burning fire of the sorrows of Shiva. O king, when Mahadev, being infatuated with Kama, went into the forest of Brigu and becoming naked, began to copulate. So you know it's copulate, it means intercourse. The ascetic Brigu, seeing him in that state, now this ascetic, you know, these guys, the sage or so-called quote-unquote holy men, seeing Shiva in that state exclaimed, oh, you are very shameless and cursed him thus. <laughs> Let your penis drop off just now, Mahadev. Mahadev meaning to say great God. That's what it means. That's what he was calling Shiva. Then to satisfy his thirst for passion, began to drink the water of the lake Amrita Vapi, dug by the Danavas. Yuck. Chapter 20, verse 34 to 37, the Srimad Dev Bhagavatam, translated by Swami Vijayananda, source. And who's translating it? Their own people. Please note, all this happened after Shiva's beloved wife died and he was not able to control his urges. And other words on Shiva's lust problem. Before that, I'll just give you, drop you the source for this one. And uh, here we go. Uh, let's get back here. So here's another verse on Shiva's lust problem. We had Muhammad, but uh, Hindus, I don't know, we, we just can't stop attacking their gods, to be really honest, because they have so many thousands of gods with so many problems, and yet they dare attack the Bible. Filthy cowards. 
Lord Shiva, his good sense taken away by the woman because of lusty desires to enjoy with her, became so mad for her that even in the presence of Bhavani, he did not hesitate to approach her. Now, Bhavani is another goddess, by the way. The beautiful woman was already naked, and when she saw Lord Shiva coming towards her, she became extremely bashful. Thus, she kept smiling, but she hid herself among the trees and did not stand in one place. His senses being agitated, Lord Shiva, victimized by lusty desires, began to follow her. Yuck! This is their god. Just as a lusty elephant follows a she-elephant, after following her with great speed, Lord Shiva caught her by the braid of her hair and dragged her near him. Although she was unwilling, he embraced her with her arms. Their god is a rapist. Their god is a rapist. Being embraced by Lord Shiva like a female elephant, embraced by a male woman, by, by a male, the woman whose hair was scattered swirl like a snake. O oh, king, this woman who had large, high hips. This pretty much sounds like a pawn show, to tell you the truth. <laughs> was a woman of yoga maya presented by the supreme personality of God. And this is their scripture, guys. These are their gods. She released herself somehow or other from the fond embrace of Lord Shiva's arms and ran away. As if harassed by an enemy in the form of lusty desires, Lord Shiva followed the path of Lord Vishnu, who acts very wonderfully and who had taken the form of a Mohini, just as a maddened bull elephant follows a female elephant who is able to conceive pregnancy. Lord Shiva followed the beautiful woman and discharged semen, even though his discharge of semen never goes in vain. O king, wheresoever on the surface of the globe fell the semen of the great personality of Lord Shiva, mines of gold and silver later appeared. So what they are saying is, wherever Shiva's uh, semen falls on the ground, mines of gold and silver appear. What the heck is this, people? Seriously. <laughs> they make Muhammad sound like the guy next door. Srimad Bhagavatam 8, 12, 25 to 3, translated by Swami Prabhupada, another one of their scholars. Click on the arrow. I can just keep giving you sources anyway. I'll put the sources later in the description box after this recording is done. Okay, now the Shivalinga. This is the stone that they worship. Shiva is often worshipped in Lingam or the penis form. That's the Shivalinga, that stone, which commonly is called Shivling or Shivlingam. For historical proof, you can search early Shivling in Google search here. A general theory is, the, is that due to British and the more modestly they introduced the shape and design of the shivling was changed. So let's see what does this Google search say. Yeah, this is the Google search. Yuck. That is what they say was uh, the actual shivlingam. Okay. But now the shivlingam which we see, its, its shape has changed. And now they want to claim that the British changed the shape. The scripture proof proof is given below. The story is same with minor variations in different Puranas. Now, Puranas are also a set of Hindu scriptures, and they are among some of the most authoritative set of scriptures, by the way, the Puranas in Hinduism. Once the leading Brahmin devotees of Shiva, engrossed in the meditation of Shiva, went into the forest for bringing sacrificial twigs. In the meantime, Shiva himself, assuming a very hideous form, came in there to test their devotion. Okay, he was very brilliant, but stark naked again. Seriously, man. He had smear ashes all over his body as the sole ornament. Standing there and holding his penis, he began to show all sorts of his history. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was with a mind to do something pleasing to the forest dwellers that Shiva, favorite of the devotees, came to the forest at his will. The wives of the sages were extremely frightened at this sight. So naturally, they saw this naked Shiva with ash all over his body, performing some hocus pocus with his penis. God knows what. The other woman, excited and surprised, approached the Lord. Some embraced him. Yuck. Others held his hands. The women were engrossed in struggling with one another. Meanwhile, the great sages came there. On seeing him engaged in perverse activities, they were pained and infuriated. So he's here screwing around with the sages' wives. Uh, and then they came over there and they saw, saw that, that their great god whom they worship is doing this. <laughs> yes, JDR. Doesn't this 
topic sound familiar you have muhammad who was doing the same things with the muslimas okay when they used to go for jihad and asking women and all these kind of things the sages deluded by shiva's maya and plunged in grief began to say who is this who is this because shiva had taken another form when the naked sage did not reply the great sages told that terrible purasa you are acting pervertedly this violates the vedic path hence let your penis fall on the ground when they said thus the penis of that avadhuta was shiva of wonderful form fell down <laughs> instantly that penis burned everything in front wherever it went <laughs> <laughs> they had to burn everything that oh boy it went to patala it went to heaven it went all over the earth it never remains to study anywhere what the heck? all the worlds and the people were distressed the sages became grief stricken by the gods the sages no one had any peace <laughs> or joy all the gods and sages who did not recognize shiva became sad they assembled together and hastened to brahma and sought refuge in them O Brahmins, after going there, they brought to and eulogized Brahma. Now this Brahma, that other pervert god I talked to you about, heard them. He realized that they had been deluded by Shiva's Maya. After bow- bowing to Shiva, he told the excellent Brahma sages, "Said, O Brahmins, you thought wise do such despicable things. Then why complain against the ignorant who act likewise? Who can wish for happiness after offending and antagonizing Shiva? Thus, if a person does not welcome and serve a guest at midday, his virtue is taken away by the guest who in return deposits his sin to him. What then of Shiva himself as a guest? As long as the pious does not become stationary, there cannot be anything good in these three worlds. I am telling you the truth, O sages. You must do such things as will make the pious of Shiva steady. Please ponder over this in your minds. Thus urged the sages, bowed to Brahma and said, "O Brahma, what shall be done by us? Please guide us in that task." So now these sages are going to Brahma to stop Shiva's penis. When the great sages asked him, "Thus Brahma, the grandfather of the world, spoke to them," Brahma said, "Let the gods propitiate Goddess Parvati and pray. If she can assume the form of a vaginal passage, that penis will become steady." Oh my goodness gracious! It just keeps getting worse, guys. Tell me now, what is worse, Hinduism or Islam? On the flip side, ninety-nine percent of your Hindus don't know all this. To be really honest, they just don't know their scripture. Oh, excellent sages, listen! I shall tell you the mode of procedure. Act accordingly with love and devotion. She will thus be thus pleased. Make an eight-petal mystic diagram of lotus and place a hot over it. Water from holy center shall be poured into the pot along with the sprouts of durva and barley. The pot shall be invoked with Vedic mantras, that is Vedic chants. It shall be worshipped according to the Vedic rituals after remembering Shiva. The penis shall be drenched with that water. O oh, great sages, when the sprinkling is made with satta or yutriya mantras, it will become unstable. Parvati, in the form of the vaginal passage and an auspicious na Parvati is another goddess. Parvati, another goddess, in the form of the vaginal pas- passage and an auspicious aru shall form as the pedestal wherein the phallus or the penis shall be installed in a- accompaniment of the Vedic mantras. And here is the source. Okay, I'll drop the source. all these books guys you buy you guys will just be able to keep this nonsense in which they think call as a god seriously they call these god people as gods i read the questions i have i read the whole chapter no where was i able to find what find what was the test also god created gender male and female why would god ever need male sex organs moreover are not gods or omniscient And if Shiva is God and God is omniscient, then he would be knowing that all this would happen. Why would God need his male sex organ if he had any, if he had any to fall off? Also, imagine the God you worshiping coming in front of you naked. Moreover, how can a human being curse God? So over here, the sages were cursing God. Another story. Okay, so this is Sanskrit, but I can read it. But I think we have done enough for the day. I don't want to go further. All right. So I'll just stop sharing. So all right. I hope you guys have been blessed, people. Hope this was an edifying session. You got to learn a thing or two about Hinduism, but 
more importantly, I hope you learn some arguments how to defend these passages. Watch that path again and again. Make them second nature. And this is how you can refute them. Once again, God bless all of you. Prayers for all of you, all your intentions. And uh, please keep me in your prayers as well. All right. So catch you later again, God willing. And have a good, great weekend, folks. God bless you all.